<laughs> well, um, I'm about just over two and a half years post part two. Right. Uh, just recently qualified as an architect, and I'm currently teaching at Greenwich University undergrad since. All right. And it's it's been exciting and inspiring, and. So what level are you teaching? Sorry. Uh, first years right now. Teaching first years. Mm -hmm. That's and amazing. So, what what was the? Did you do any kind of like build up? teaching experience like did you do you must have done loads of like crits sat in on loads of crits right i've sat in on crits i've been like before 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 doing greenwich yeah, yeah. I've, I've been helping out my tutor doing drawing workshops for students from our school of architecture to mm -hmm. um nus in mm -hmm. singapore and also wow. um been helping out some master students in in our unit amazing um, yeah throughout the few years and it's been fun cool man before we get into the details of your of your projects, uh, which by the way I found fascinating, thank you, um, and fantastical, <laughs> do, I do want to talk about that. I do want to talk about the Bartlett culture itself. Sure, I think it's it's something that a lot of students are curious about. Mm. I don't know if you've been asked it by people. You know, the whole Bar have you been asked about the Bartlett culture before? Yeah, it tends to happen when we we go from we go. From we come from different schools and I came from Cardiff and then I meet up with some old friends and they're like, oh, how was the Bartlett Masters or how was the whole experience? What was it, what was it like? Mm -hmm. And when you enter practice, you meet new people and then right. you have a similar conversation. How was it? Et cetera, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. So, so you might not have had a very in-depth kind of conversation about it. Um, Maybe it's kind of been like, oh yeah, it's good. It's kind of, you know, this and that. Yeah, no, not entirely because it's also quite specific to the unit you go into, the sort of, the year you have, the, the people you're around, the tutor you have, and and the school has changed throughout the several years. Right. It's been in the old Bartlett. There was a temporary moment where we were in Hampstead, um, Hampstead yes, Road. Yes, I remember that. And now we're back in the new Bartlett. So yeah, I remember when you were coming back into the building. Mm. Yeah. So generally, where does the? I mean, look. So there seems to be almost a feeling of, from from the outsider, it seems to be a feeling of conformity in Bartlett students kind of consistently producing fictional and like grand illustrations. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're wary of that. That's a, that's a common conception from the outside. Of the, I, the, they're all producing fictional and grand illustrations. Yeah, okay. So, you know, for the, for the architecture proposal. So, mm -hmm. first of all, do you agree? And, you know, where do you think this culture, so to speak, originates from? Yeah, um, I think there tends to be, I might be wrong, there tends to be a conception, like you said, that, that we do have these illustrations and these grand illustrations and fictional ideas but I think what people don't really see is the whole body of work from the start of the year right until the end in our unit we tend to do these drawings in the last two to three weeks so everything you see that is published mm -hmm. um, or or you've seen in the show is very very small proportion of the work we've done mm. it's probably about maybe five five percent ten percent of the work we actually produce and it's it's a way to realize and to bring together all the research and all the development we've done up until now and obviously the Bartlett show we try to bring everyone in every student that's participated and done their work so there's only a set amount of space per student so they want to show the best work and show everything mm -hmm. all in one and th that's usually around 10 drawings that we have published but in that time frame from the beginning we've done maybe over 100 sheets of research development portfolio work wow, yeah. iterations going back and forth and i think that's the real rigor in some of our projects that some people don't get to see and hopefully some people would have the opportunity to see it mm. when people present their portfolios i think what's important is to have a level of criti critical thinking and to have a position in architecture and once you have that it's exciting because you get to ask the what if question mm -hmm. and why this has happened or w in our unit we don't work to look for a solution or solve a problem we ask the question what if and what if this happens how and this is a speculative proposal to mm -hmm. act as a driver for a conversation and a debate and once this exchange happens then we we raise the level of conversation and then it just it just becomes an exciting endeavor mm -hmm. and i think that's that's the great thing about it it's not fictional because it's we have to do a fictional proposal but it's it's a sort of sort of driver that mm -hmm. lets us ask these questions so would you say it's it's, it's hypothetical the, the hypothetical is very crucial in in developing a concept that kind of 
perhaps stands the uh, sort of last stands the, the 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 test of time. Yes and no. I think it it really it should encapsulate the sort of spirit of the walking city and all of these great endeavors back before. And once you hold that, you you ask a series of questions. What does it mean for a city to this or a building to do this? And then this conversation continues and continues, and that's mm. what makes it exciting. Yeah, man. Cool. So, I mean, what is the? Because you 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 mentioned that there is a there's also these technical technological considerations that people perhaps don't know of. Mm-hmm. So, what what is the level of techno? Te- you know, what what is expected of you in terms of obviously when you come into your masters, mm-hmm. you are uh, you are expected to have a, a much more deeper understanding of how architecture really works, mm-hmm. and so you say even with all those kind of uh you know kind of deep projects that 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 pose the questions the the hypothetical questions what's the level of technological consideration put into those buildings yeah so um in the bartlett uh the fourth and fifth years are fairly different in the fourth year you have a module called design realization and in that module you you have to consider a lot of technical aspects and you basically have to have a booklet that demonstrates the basically like a typical planning proposal where you have the concept and then you then you also go through structure environmental and through to delivery and procurement of your project Mm -hmm. and and that's a booklet that people present towards the end of the year and that's part of the module that we have to complete Mm. and in that time we learn all these things we have external consultants come in that support us and guide us and give us feedback on how our sort of speculative proposal can be kind of realized that's why it's called design realization Mm -hmm. And we also have another module, which is history and theory and understanding understanding that sort of background. And that fourth year kind of sets up a sort of base for us to explore something in fifth year. Right. Yeah, so fifth year becomes a lot more experimental, a lot more speculative, oh, okay. a, lot, a lot more, you know, it's, now's your time, you've, you've done that. How do you utilize that and everything you've learned there and and propose something Something new. Something so greater. fifth year is the, the the serious year, you know. Is your fourth year graded so sort of, to your final grade? Yes, the fourth year is graded. Um, it's a small percentage of the overall year. Yeah. Smaller percentage, not a small percentage. So what is it? Do you know? Uh, I forgot off the top of my head. Generally, yeah. sort of forty, sixty, or is it less than that? Probably, probably. Um, it's not like ten percent. I'm I'm not sure off the top right, of right, right, right. Mm-hmm. Because it's at Westminster where we are. The the yeah. first year actually doesn't count. Oh really? Yeah. The fourth year doesn't actually count towards your final grade. Mm. Um, but it is as you say, they try to prepare you as much as possible for like yeah. a serious. This is your year kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, that's interesting. Mm. So there is. Uh, I mean, I keep. I'll, I'll probably keep coming back to this fictional thing because no, that's by, fine. By far, it's the most common. Um, uh, sort of uh, portrayal of of of, Bar- of the Bartlett. Okay. Um, Do you think it's because of the rise of platforms such as Instagram or the Bartlett Show? In that's general, a very or? good question. It, it and I when hopefully if we do a, a a podcast with someone big on Instagram, yeah, uh, sort of that if they're you know someone like Crit Day or Archisource or mm-hmm. all these people, um, we can ask them mm. what they think because I think there's something to it because the Instagram culture is is one that they want the drawing that stands out mm. and that's how these platforms which are they're so popular they're bigger than you know some you know some of the biggest fashion names in, in, in the world yeah architecture Instagram pages have more followers than them mm. um, and the way they fuel it is because the culture in architecture itself is so uh, is so competitive mm. um, that everyone's kind of pumping out these cool visuals mm. so maybe it is so um, okay what do you think but architecture is also a very visual profession so of course. you have to be able to see everything and really present it and showcase your ideas of course so i think it's an exciting platform and it's definitely a new one that 100 you have to sort of be part of embrace it yeah embrace it, i mean yeah. I'm, I'm 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 a prolific <laughs> instagram kind of <laughs> uh, what do you call it <laughs> addict when it comes to putting out visuals you know anyone can see on the on the two worlds page i'm always putting out visuals but i guess there is criticism in yeah. obviously obviously it is true that architecture is visual and that's how you you know that's the essence of reeling in of interest into uh, reading an in interest of the project mm-hmm. um 
So you can't, you know, you can't ignore it. Um, but it seems it's almost to be uh, the main, or if not the predominant factor, when it comes to not just Bartlett. Uh, by the way, instead of attacking Bartlett all the time, no. um, in all unis, I think what's really exciting about some of the drawings you're talking about is that it wouldn't have come about without um, that 80-90% of work throughout the year to get to the final drawing Yeah, because that research, that development in plan, section, elevation um, through to master planning proposals and strategies really helped to inform that final drawing that drawing wouldn't have happened and we wouldn't have that level of detail all those activities, all all the composition, the color decisions, through to everything to get to that drawing, and that's that's the bit where the drawing becomes a lot more credible, where mm -hmm. you have a strong portfolio to support it and to back it, and you can tell the story through the drawing, so that no piece of information on that drawing is vacuous. Mm. So, if you were to question um, an aspect of the drawing, I'd be able to hopefully explain. Yeah, I mean, what it, happens there you, and why it's like this, what color I chose, yeah. why the composition is like that, why the tectonic is like that, um, why is it so fantastical, why is there so many leaves or whatever it is, you might have a question too yeah. that it would be like, oh, it's because of this, this research informs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think yeah. that's what makes it so much more credible and so much more informed that it makes it a very rich and powerful drawing. Right. I mean, that's a good. That's a good case right there. <laughs> so I think that kind of brings us on to what is your design background I mean obviously not because I'm talking about in, in terms of you know before you even got to uni mm. so were you always drawing as a child were you really interested in animating and what yeah no I loved drawing as a child yeah. and um, and then I did art English, maths, What economics. kind of drawings were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not the ones that I ever thought I dreamed of doing at yeah. all. Um, just just your standard life drawing sort of sketches and um, doodles here and there. Yeah. And just ideas, but nothing. I never really brought everything together. Mm -hmm. So you're always artsy? A little, yeah, to a degree, yeah. And I wanted to bring the arts with something else. Right. Yeah. And I think that's usually what attracts the... The, the the person to architecture, architecture is that they have the artistic flair yeah but they want it to be kind of based on something i guess intellectual mm. and that's the beauty of it i guess so what is you so so do you learn a great deal of illustration techniques at the bartlett or do you do you have because obviously the people applying mm -hmm. would be coming with with a high level of drawing ability um but it seems the level that's produced, the level of drawing that's produced is, is, is so high. Is that something everyone comes in with or is it something you learn there as well? Um, I don't think it's something you come in with because I would never forget the time when I started architecture in the Butler and or when I first worked with my tutor. I I wasn't great at all. Who I didn't was your tutor, if you don't mind? Uh, CJ Lim. Of course. Um, yeah. And um, I think what he took me on because... I was hungry to learn and willing to try mm -hmm. and I was open minded about that and I think yeah I think as a tutor to take someone on like that with without that ability and just just up your hunger I, f I found very powerful and very Why inspiring. do you say you had l not not the you didn't have the ability? Well, I I didn't I'd never have dream dreamt to have done such amazing drawings and such a great project. Right. If I wasn't as hungry as inspired and ready to learn right, okay. and um so you almost surprised yourself. I surprised myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Cool. Yeah, I mean, again, the CJ Lim brings up interesting questions as well because what people may not know is that a lot of the drawings that are labelled all the same, mm -hmm. you know, the whole Bartlett culture thing, is a lot of them are actually produced from consistently from the same studios. Yeah. So generally in those studios, you're going to have a similar drawing style. Mm -hmm. um, because that's the way the studio works. Is that correct? To a degree, yeah. I think um, in each studio, there's around 10 to 15 students every year. So, And there's very long-standing studios that have been very established, very young and also energetic ones that have come, come in. And they all bring something new and different and diversity to the Bartlett. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it really exciting. Mm -hmm. But in regard to the question of... Regarding the question of um, is the drawing style similar throughout the year mm -hmm. I think it's we have a, we probably compose drawings 
similar to a degree, but it's to do with the narrative and the story. So we might yeah. have a foreground of something that relates to our project, and we set it back to uh, maybe a perspective to mm. activate activity within the space, and then we might have a background of, I don't know, a plan or to indicate where it sits, right. for example. But so, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, you were asking? So I was just gonna say that that, that structure which you're describing yeah, is what I'm actually referring to. Okay. So you see, with you know, there's these grand drawings mm -hmm. that have the, like you said, the kind of a, a, a an intimate perspective, followed by perhaps a, a something going down into a, a much longer perspective, mm -hmm. and then it almost kind of rides up vertically. Mm -hmm. That's something you see quite often with with the with the drawings. Okay. Uh, from CJ Lim Studio, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's something which is part of the the if you like the drawing template. Um, or does, does not everyone anyone can do what they want? That's I just think anyone can do what they want as long as their drawing encapsulates the project, um, has the right level of information and right level of detail to really bring the project to life. Mm -hmm. I think in that sense, yes. But in terms of composition, we kind of, because we're in such a tight-knit studio of 10 to 15 students, we always talk to each other. People think it's quite a competitive um environment about that yeah that's to degree. another question actually yes it is but at the same time because you're in a unit of 10 to 15 people you're you're always there with each other and you're always helping each other out i think that's one thing that's a that's another misconception in my opinion because we were quite a tight-knit unit and we worked very closely with each other if we didn't know a question or didn't have to use a program or someone had a particular drawing technique or an idea we'd share it and be like oh yeah maybe you could try it this way or oh, i know a better way to do this in this program or and then just kind of just elevates us as a unit and helps us and yeah mm -hmm. so the competitivity is is in is between studios not not between peers if you I'm like. not even sure if it's between studios I think it's everyone wants to do the best they can of course and because you're in an environment of someone of everyone who's so talented and so great at what they do that you're like I want to I want to try and do as much as I can as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't particularly like that criticism, you know, because <laughs> you want to be in an environment where you're pushed to your limits. Yeah, no, most definitely. Yeah, because that's how you produce the best stuff. Yeah, so definitely. That's not. I don't think that's a bad thing. Mm. But yeah, I mean, again, we we spoke about concept before. Mm -hmm. um, generally, concept is another hugely important part of architecture proposal, and arguably the most important. Okay. People would say that the concept actually is of co because the concept informs the design, so the concept is, is is predominantly more important. Do you think is there a point at which concepts become so outlandish, uh, so fictional that they they no longer serve any real function but to just entertain or intrigue the person? And I think I I don't want to pose that in a negative way mm -hmm. because I also understand that there's a huge value to storytelling. Mm -hmm. And especially in proposing an idea, mm -hmm. um, if there's no story, uh, actually, let me change that. If there is a story, mm -hmm. the concept is much more meaningful and easily portrayed to people. But do you think, as I said earlier, do you think there is a there is a point, uh, either when you're studying in 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 the Bartlett, or generally speaking, for you personally, is there a point at which the concepts can become a bit too fictional? I think I think there's a clear distinction between concept, idea, a story and having a position. And I think um each unit works quite differently and during my time in the Bartlett the way our unit worked was that we started with a story and we chose okay. a story. That was the novel you you did was it 1666 novel, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's called The Blazing World and we That's all chose it. our own narrative, but that acts as a starting point to kind of activate our project and get it started. Very so we sort of extrapolate some sort of spatial ideas from the story. So you'd probably go through the story, pull out some ideas, what does it encapsulate if it's about this and this? Sorry, can I just interject there? Sure. Um that that procedure of selecting a novel before you start your design project is that specific to the CJ Lim studio? Is that it generally how the Bartlett? Um, it was specific to the CJ Lim studio and every year he might switch it up and try something different right. as a way of starting the project. But that was the period where I was there and that was the way we started our project, yeah. which was through a narrative that we chose. Amazing. And so since I did mention the value of storytelling, mm -hmm. what do you think the value is of, of actually finding a novel? Yeah, so so from, from the novel, you kind of extrapolate these ideas, and then from these ideas, you sort of define, what is my brief? What is my program? What is my position? 
and the brief it has to come back to the brief during that period our brief was called um, the poetics of a resilient city so the question asked was what makes a city resilient so the story we chose have to has to have sort of had that idea in there what makes a city resilient so I chose a story where um, this this protagonist she sees all these amazing things and she's like wow diversity water wealth sunlight I want to bring this all back to the United Kingdom and then and make it whole again that's that was that was her that was the story that's what the novel was about so I thought okay what does it mean for a city to resilient what if so and then it came unity, bringing everyone together and having all these different components of um, water, light, diversity. And that sort of formed my brief and sort of that's how my project started. So it wasn't really the fictional aspect was brought all the way through. It was used as an initial driver to sort of propel my project and to give it sort of a framework before I start to develop it. Sorry, but before you continue, what actually brought you to selecting that novel in the first place? So I wanted to look at one of the earliest sort of reforms in the in London and oh, okay. 1666 was the great fire of London sure. and then the whole city changed and reformed and it was it was also one of the sort of precursors to science fiction a very early novel mm. and it was written by um, a woman in the time and I just thought all these all these aspects was quite powerful and it was a very strong story and I thought maybe maybe I could take a look into that and see where it would take me definitely yeah and I mean, then that sort of formed the driver to it that's amazing yeah and what's exciting is that every student would choose a different story or a different narrative mm. piece of prose or whatever it might be and sometimes you might start with a an issue a piece of text a painting an art piece um or any sort of initial starting driver that would really take your project up and i think that's that's the exciting part to our studio i really like that i really like because i think from a personal point of view mm. Uh, generating the the kind of initial conceptual ideas is is quite difficult mm. um because obviously w when you have in, you know in traditional architecture uh practice yeah. you would have a context you'd have a client so it's very easy to find out what you need to do mm. but when you're proposing ideas in university and kind of thinking of much bigger ideas yeah um even if you do have an amazingly creative and 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 high functioning brain and you're always thinking of crazy ideas it needs to be premised on something, I guess, objective mm. or something, something that has substance. Yeah. So I really do see the value of of, of finding something fictional mm. to 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 kind of extrapolate the meanings of and extrapolate the significance of. I think it's important to to have a position, and that's what it sort of helps yeah. bring. And it's also it acts as a sort of speculative lens to sort of kind of you know bring your discourse and your conversation to a different level mm -hmm. and I think that's the exciting part of it rather than it being this concept or idea or fictional thing right so you keep saying having a position yeah so if you were to deliberate a bit more on, on, on what that means so I was I remember when I started I was floating a bit I wasn't sure what what made a city resilient or what my position was and my position was cities are resilient when they're united and it took me a very long time to get there <laughs> to even say that and um, I was like what does what does that mean what does it encapsulate? How does my project still go forward from there? Mm. And I think what's really exciting about the project was I had this position back in September 2015 before the referendum was announced and then the day the Bartlett show um, came, was on was the day Brexit was also announced. So it was a yeah, very... Yeah, I was actually going to ask. That's pretty crazy. A very strangely yeah. timely... Yeah. It was, yeah, so it, it just, to a degree, it shows the sort of power of... Of your mind. Not, not my psychic. mind. No, no, no. <laughs> of of proposing something speculative yeah. and, and hypothetical and what if, and then, you know, stuff happens and some people have a question or debate about it. Some people might have a project about rising sea levels in different countries and mm. they have a proposal for that. And then it just brings, just elevates this conversation and... Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't be having this conversation today if it wasn't. Yeah. yeah. And that's, yeah. What's the opposite of having a position? As simple as that question sounds. But in the uh, in the architectural sense, in, 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 I guess I'm asking is, what would be a mistake in terms of approaching a project, of, of, of a way of pro approaching a project without a position? Is that just kind of, I'm doing this because, kind of very shallow level, I, I want to look at how it can improve an area? 
I think that's really important as well. That's mm-hmm. having a position, improve. I want to improve this area. That's that's a position, isn't it? Okay, so when you say having a position, you're not referring to kind of being on I don't know a right or left kind of the right or left or if you oh having almost like a political opinion about something. I think having a position doesn't mean you have to believe in one or the other. It just means you're taking the stance of one and proposing your project from that, and that way people can either have this conversation, debate against it or with it or. And that's the exciting thing. Mm. I, I say exciting a lot, but I, mm. I find it really exciting. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't have to really believe in it, but you have to believe in your project. And and that's what makes it exciting. But you have to go, what if? I think the powerful question is what if? Is what if? Yeah. So that's the best way, I guess, to define what you mean by having a position, mm. is you're asking that Yeah, deep the asking question, the what if what question, if. yeah. Okay. That's very interesting. I mean, I guess that kind of leads on to the, a bit of a deep question okay um and that tends to happen in this podcast um <laughs> so what what do you think the purpose of architecture is essentially in, in it, i mean yes it sounds almost cheesy but in its fundamental value is it is it a function based f- is it function based predominantly is it expressionistic uh, in terms of practice at its core <sighs> or because i had this conversation with with adam mm-hmm. and we went into the kind of the philosophy of the value of object okay and it was incredible. We had a profound example of of walking into a person, a recently deceased person's room, mm. and seeing their possessions. Mm. And even from a psychological point of view, it's easy to to see that when you see possessions, it it, it imbues almost a, a much more significant sense of of nostalgia and much more significant sense of knowing that person's identity. Mm. And you, know, you that's a very interesting discussion we had. But we we talked about the value of story, and mm-hmm. maybe I think this could link. But it, it, I, I'd love to know what you think of of what you think at the at, at its very basis, at very at its very core. What architecture should do, and you know, is it, it it might be fluid and always changing? I don't know what you think. That's a it's a very deep and profound question. Yeah, and um, I'd love to know what you think <laughs> about. It. I'm not quite sure. I have a very succinct answer for this either Mm -hmm. and I don't even think I have an answer for it to be fair (laughs) but um, maybe that is the answer maybe yeah (laughs) but I think architecture is such a all-encompassing soft discipline Mm -hmm. and what's exciting about it every day is that you learn something new you can be interested in many different things and some might say we're sort of expert generalists (laughs) Mm -hmm. because we we sort of dabble in everything and you wake up every day and you can be excited by one thing or another and then you can do a project on it or you can consider it and use it and um, it's part of the experience. Definitely. And that's what I'm sort of taking with it so far. Yeah, definitely. I, I see that is because, you know, I'd be doing a project, like if I was just to talk about the kind of specialisms you focus on mm. uh, in relation to your architecture, mm. you know, it's gone from like, hairdressers to exactly. you know gardening to you know you end up learning so much yeah and that's I, that's a huge part of it as well mm. uh, I guess that kind of brings us on to your actual project okay so cohesion mm. the blueprint for a united kingdom <laughs> mm-hmm. so you, uh, as we said uh, as you said it was it was based on a, the 166 novel the blazing wow. world um, what I found really fascinating is and it kind of hit me again because uh, you mentioned how, uh, y- you know, something almost almost too simple for for you to be like, this is a profound fact, but it's so, so simple, it almost smacks you in the face. Okay. So it involves changing the capital city from London mm. <laughs> to, to, to the Isle of Man. Yeah. Um, which you say would, uh, from on the website, I found that uh, would radically redistribute wealth and ease pressures on London's transport and housing market. Mm-hmm. And I thought about that and I was like, oh, wow, I really see how that could work. <laughs> and I found that really, really interesting. So can you tell me a little bit more about that aspect of the project? Yeah, so um, Cohesion, in fifth year, we do a design project and we also write a thesis. My thesis was all about capital cities, what capital cities are, why have they relocated previously in the past, be it for political reasons, environmental sustainability reasons, mm-hmm. to have it safer in the centre, nearer a harbour, for symbolic reasons, be it peace or unity, and looking at different case studies like Brasilia and Chan- Chandigarh, and, and what these capital cities meant and what they were trying to do. And 
that was a sort of sort of like research and sort of driver to sort of bring that sort of idea into my proposal mm-hmm. so what it means to relocate the capital city is it symbolic is it wh- what does it mean mm. was the question and part of the research was looking at what what does what constitutes to the uk is it the state the church the queen and then so a lot of the pro- like in the proposal a lot of the drawings really encapsulate sort of a britishness this flags this queen and sort of bring that sort of endeavor back in and what's also interesting is that the the tectonics and the architecture references different aspects of key icons from around different capital cities so some of the housing units look like swans and t- castles but that was based on the idea that in Cardiff Cardiff has the most castles per square mile in the world and um, I thought that idea was very fascinating and so this project had this whole landscape of sort of castle typologies within it and then also um, there's a sort of border tectonic which is like the sort of where people enter the sort of gates and these gates reference Marble Arch Marble Arch used to house um, used to have an office for a lone police officer and it acted as a gate gateway and that took reference from that and also took reference from Scotland Yard being sort of security sort of like police station in the UK and it's just drawing references from different capital cities and bringing them into my architecture mm-hmm. and that sort of formed this yeah cohesion and the project yeah. was called cohesion because I had this conversation with my tutor and went what should the city be called what should a project be called and why was it why should it be called what should it be called and that was an important conversation to have and the project was called cohesion because it should be called what it does hmm. and it should bring people together and unite the whatever and it's kind of similar to the idea that um, it was called Pleasantville but it wasn't very pleasant and another person's project was about hope but he had a site called Cape Disappointment and it's a sort of that sort of play and that sort of accessibility to the project I think mm. that's exciting and yeah, sorry mm. that's really interesting man I, you mentioned the queen I remember seeing one of your visuals you had a it was like a, sh- a shrub, like yeah. a massive shrub of the queen. <laughs> yeah. It looked about 40 foot high. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, coming back to the il- illustrations, just wanted to know, how, like, when you're doing that in the in the drawing, is that like a, is that post-editing? Or, I mean, we'll get back onto more details of the project yeah, uh, yeah. No, in a course. second, but I just want to go into the, 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 d- the technical side of it again. <laughs> it's like every I'm intrigued, honestly. Architecture, s- yeah, students... Yeah, questions. I love it. This is the typical one. Like, what software? Did you yeah, use? what software? I get seriously. So what posts. what software did you use? <laughs> uh, it was just a CAD based program called MicroStation. Come on, it is no it's for every. Uh, what about you? Didn't do any three D model making? Yeah, MicroStation three D. Oh lord. Yeah, there's MicroStation and there's Photoshop. But that it Queen Bush, that wasn't. Du- that's just drawn. I in. mean, that Queen Shrub, <laughs> that wasn't done in. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't done in three D. That was drawn. There's a mixture of 2D, 3D elements. So that was done post-edit, right? Um, it was done in the 2D file once you export the lines. And you everything. just did that freehand? Uh, yeah. Well, through either clicking it around or... You, you did that picture of the queen freehand? Well, as in on the computer? Yeah, yeah. Freehand, freehand, on, freehand, on, freehand Yeah, freehand on the computer, yes. That's impressive. I thought you meant freehand. When I was like, <laughs> that's impressive. <laughs> I have to say that's impressive. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, what generally in your design process yeah what uh, do you do you jump from program to program microstation is quite a quite a quite an old it so- is. piece of software very but reliable of course very reliable i think the powerful thing about microstation is that you can get the lines out when you really need them mm-hmm. <laughs> and especially in a unit where you do a lot of line based drawing you need to get the lines out as crisp as you can yeah. be an illustrator as well or any other program but i know some friends might struggle on maybe sketch up Rhino where it's like oh it's taking hours to export or whatever <laughs> but um, it takes a large model there's, and you can reference a lot of things in and a lot of big practices actually use MicroStation yeah mm-hmm. they still use them yeah but obviously it's turning to Revit now and yeah so mm. w- in terms of the the actual modelling on the on the software the 3D modelling mm-hmm. is it as fluid uh, I don't know is it a similar style to Rhino or similar to Revit or what 
Does it, is it similar to any of them? <laughs> I don't think it's similar to any of them. Really? Microstation 3D is quite a strange program, but I think the limitations to it somehow make for some happy mistakes in your architecture. Like, <laughs> I couldn't quite model that, and you try it a different way, and it turns out something quite different. And then that's the exciting thing as well about <laughs> Microstation as well. That yeah, there's flexibility and also limitations, and once you sort of realize how that works, some unexpected and great things happen. Yeah, man. So do you actually, do you actually change what softwares you use depending on the project? Um, or do you have the same kind of design process? I've been working through MicroStation and that sort of way of drawing throughout my fifth year project and that's what I've taken through the whole thing, okay. really. But I think there was another question you had which was about does the design process change depending on project? Yep. And I think, yes, it does. I think um, if you do a project based on sort of paintings, then it'd be great to do sort of design process through painting. Mm. And if it's a project about, well, my project was about sort of Britishness. I, I, I really drew from British artists and painters and graphic designers to um, like, yeah, cool. Heath Robinson, uh, Lowry and drawing the colors from them and the yeah. uh, sort of wit and graphic like representation of- Even your figures, the people. Yeah, so it's really about the project and what, it, what spirit and what, what it encapsulates and then you really draw from that, that sort of reference palette to really help inform and bring it to a sort of higher level. I, I like think. that. I, I think that's very key, especially if we have any sort of uh, part one listeners or or uh, viewers who mm. are even, maybe people even thinking about coming into studying architecture. I think that's a very important thing to, to know that mm. your design process can change 100%. and should change. Mm, most definitely. Yeah. Um, I also remember having one of my crits. I did a lot of my initial drawings in black and white mm -hmm. because I, I guess I was avoiding. Yeah, I was just was just doing it in black and white. It was quicker. Leading up to the leading up to yeah. the crit, and then one of the conversations I had with one of the critics, Christine Hawley, was, "Eric, are you are you using black and white to hide hide some of the details of what's not really happening in the architecture? Surely, why don't you consider color and what that means in your project?" Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of the drawings later had a lot of color and it was just referencing different cinematographers like Chris Doyle looking at Wes Anderson and all these different color palettes and what it meant and how you could really bring certain things forward and what you wanted to really express mm -hmm. so she described a scene about a very like rainy scene all you can see is these yellow boots walking through and that was a very powerful image in my head and I thought okay how can I use color to really express some of my architecture or what I'm trying to propose or what I'm trying to say to mm -hmm. the person seeing my drawing. And that's why I'm not sure if I should go into detail on some of the drawings, yeah, but so. there are, there's a drawing with chandeliers yep. and it's a very sort of night, night drawing with the moon in the background. Yep. And it was quite a yellow drawing with sort of whitish background. Mm -hmm. Like the moon was white and the tectonics was sort of creamier. And I wanted to differentiate the difference between uh, artificial light, which was what they were, they were solar collectors, and also the natural light in the background. And also there was just changing season throughout the year and I wanted the drawings to be read throughout the day. So there's a sort of sunset towards the end of the day drawing where everything was collected and it was a sort of red, reddish sunset drawing. Mm -hmm. And then there was another drawing that's more like a summer, summertime drawing. and. It was all about collecting all these green greenery and having fruits and vegetables and what sort of fruits were grown in that period and during that time and how that would feel on a nice summer's day having a picnic and everything and it was also looking at one of the drawings another drawing was a sort of landscape drawing it's called swan settlements and you see the sea of sort of red um castles and i really took inspiration from larry's paintings and capturing the sort of romanticized industrial like British sort of landscape and I took all those colors and really utilized that to sort of bring that back into my project as well so color was a very powerful development in my project mm -hmm. and was a really considered thing that wasn't hopefully not used sort of brashly mm. I mean I think that again highlights a very important point that whatever you do mm. in the in the kind of architecture design process however i guess extraordinarily crazy it might be mm. if you've got a purpose and you've got a reason and you've got a, a, a essentially a 
th- there's always there's a substance behind it mm. and it and that substance and that meaning contributes to the aim of the project yeah that's i think that's what people are looking for in the crits when they ask you the questions when they criticize your project Most definitely. they want you to say look okay that's the reason it's red over there that's the reason it's curved over there mm. i think a lot of the r- problems that uh, f- students fall into is is not the fact that they're going for the crazy things mm. but the fact that it's not meaningful yeah and i think as long yeah. as you're applying meaning to what you're to what you're trying what you're producing mm. uh, you'll be able to stand your ground <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah i think it's about making very informed development decisions and and making it stand yeah definitely and i think may- maybe that feeds into the misconception uh, that people yes. have of the bartlett yeah i think that's definitely true because some people are oh, you know the blue drawings or the yellow drawings but the students before me that done those drawings had very informed decisions as to why it was that color or why it was done that way and that's why when i look at these drawings when people go oh the drawings are very similar but when i look at other students in my unit's drawings i go wow it's amazing they've thought about this or considered this or used this kind of color or this composition or this way of drawing and we all draw using different programs even though we're in the same unit and we all some draw freehand on illustrator some yeah some draw actual freehand and hatch it and what's the most extraordinary thing you've seen a student do i think i think all of them have done very extraordinary things oh come on there must be one that stands out i saw one guy do everything everything hand drawn and of course you see that every now and then but i'm talking like I mean, he produced so many drawings, but they were the t- every single thing was hatched out in a pen. I think when when the student or anyone puts a level of care, time, and rigor into a drawing, it could be the most beautiful thing ever. So as long as you put, people will see care and put that's and see it. Time I into think it. Yeah. drawings are honest. They're, yeah. they're, 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 <laughs> there's 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 they're proof of the amount of time and effort you put into. But then that's to a degree also a misconception. We, what is the time and effort? Yes, people put a lot of time, but because people mis um, judge the time we put in, mm-hmm. they think, "Oh wow, you have only done ten drawings all year." Is that all you present at your crit? No, that's all we present at the Butler show. Or, exactly. Or, uh, so that yeah. So that's a short time, but we yeah. still put a lot of really concentrated, focused time into that, even if it is two or three weeks. Sure. But it doesn't take us a whole year to do it. It seems like these drawings are almost like posters. Okay. They're almost like because now that now that I understand that you're talking, there's there's a whole there's a plethora of work that that's kind of uh, led to these you know beautifully illustrated drawings. Mm-hmm. It's almost as if those y- your studio and your uni wants you to produce these extremely uh, bold drawings and posters that sell the project. Oh, you, you should definitely sell the project. Yeah. Um, but it, it seems like it's a very it's a, it's a core part of the culture at Bartlett, as opposed to, for example, other unis may not push you s- push you so far into producing very very vigorous v- visuals. I think. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, I think every unit has a different way of working, and some units might produce some of the most amazing models as an end result. Mm. Some might produce the most beautiful plans. Some might produce a very amazing flat elevation of of the whole scheme sure. some might do a very fantastical drawing that has loads of activity and flora fauna and everything else and some might do an amazing section cut with p- amazing dark and light shades in and that really depends on the unit mm-hmm. and the way someone wants to approach their project and once again it's specific to their project and the way the unit works but um do, the question was they encourage you to do these end results, these large posters. I think the Bartlett Show is such a such an amazing platform for all the students. So they definitely want to show their best work, mm. but they've got so much research and so much work. How do they really show everything? So they really want to encapsulate everything in this yes. this end product. It's like a bookend, isn't it? Or, yep, exactly. And it, it's quite nice to have that to go. This is this is the lead up to it. This is now you see when you see the model. Hopefully, you'll understand the research. Or when you've when you've gone through my portfolio, you go, oh, I get it now, mm. and then then that's the sort of, yeah, that's the great thing about it, I think. Definitely, no, I completely get that. I mean, I think I've 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 kind of uh, fired enough questions about the Bartlett. 
<laughs> I mean, I think pe- maybe people want, wanted me to do that. I feel. No, what else is that? Are you sure? That's more. I'm, yeah. I feel like You're I've, been ready. Asked, You're I've, ready. Asked, I've been asked a few more in the past. Oh, really? <laughs> have I not got the good yeah. ones? I, I think you have to a degree. Um, what other misconceptions do you think there are? This is your platform now. This is my platform. <laughs> <laughs> um, apart from drawings taking a whole year or based on illustrations, or I think, what else? But that's very specific to our unit. Mm. Or s- not just our units, maybe some others, but um, yeah, I I just wish they saw some some portfolios and be like, wow. <laughs> Definitely. So I, I've actually been to a Butler show, mm. um, but again, all the, the only drawings that were on display were those kind mm. of visually bold ones. Where where could people find more information and more more access to these kind of more you know the the substance of the projects, if you like. Um, I think the Bartlett have recently been doing something called Open Crits where some students present throughout sure. the year um, and I think some of them do present as introductory when people come into the Bartlett or want to apply and they show their portfolios or or maybe you could just ask some of them and go mm-hmm. yeah I think that would really open up a new conversation be like oh okay this is this is the rigor behind it which is why Instagram has also been great because you can start showing a lot more than just those final drawings you can show sort of development some iterations maybe a sketch in a sketchbook or something else and yeah <laughs> I feel like the I feel like I feel like the Bartlett culture has by the way is, is that annoying when I say no, the no, Bartlett no, culture I don't, I don't mind yeah, okay cool so the, I I've like experienced both uh, two very different schools from being in Foundation St. Martin's to to undergrad in Cardiff to obviously a master's in the Bartlett but I was also kind of in the Bartlett in second year kind of if that makes I, I was helping out my tutor I started working for him mm-hmm. in my second year in Cardiff okay. and then I was also um, his year out student so so I was kind of in that culture mm-hmm. from early before I even started masters and right so I really saw that transition saw the difference so that you do think there is a distinct culture within every uni yeah there's a distinct culture but then I don't say I'm biased towards defending everything the Bartlett does I, I just have I can see the difference between the way I was working in Cardiff and the way I was working in the Bartlett and that I'm I'm not defending it for the sake of defending it because I've been through it the whole way I, I know like you know the value of what you've been through you've yeah done. exactly what do you think they, they, they might fall short on compared to other unis uh, the Bartlett mm. <laughs> I'm not sure come on you can tell <laughs> us come on <laughs> I'm not sure I uh, know genuinely I'm not sure because I had an amazing experience there I had great peers great support and the most amazing tutors yeah. that that you know that sort of guided us throughout the process so what so i guess what is your perception of of other universities uh, maybe the maybe westminster maybe the london met um, cuz i do again this might be a bit of a controversial one but <laughs> I've, I've heard people talk about you know like uh, I bet you know the Bartlett people look down on all the other unis and things like that do do you see that uh, that there are potentially other unis that do things extremely well and what what, what unis do you think they most, are? Uh, most definitely I think a which, lot of unis, unis, which unis do you think do something really well for example? I, I love all the young London unis are doing great stuff from mm-hmm. like you said Westminster through to Greenwich through to like the AA and, and RCA and yeah they're all doing amazing stuff and they have amazing tutors what I guess I like is um, for example one of the guests we had we talked about how L- London Met are very phenomenological in the, mm. in the things they do uh, the Bartler are obviously very uh, fictional and, and, and do a lot of storytelling what do you think you don't agree with that no I don't no <laughs> I think that's very specific to certain unit that might have had a lot more sure maybe sort of exposure and maybe what the outside student might just see and want to do so would you what would you describe as the maybe the 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 fundamental culture of the Bartlett <sighs> since you did say that you think it does, uh, unis do have a distinct culture yeah they do we just have uh, uh, culture in what sense as in work ethic as in uh sort of output or, or what do you what do you mean i guess i mean so for example you'd say that, you know the london met like to do a lot of phenomenological projects okay, in understand. a very general sense yeah 
you know, I guess with the with Westminster, they're known for for a lot of their uh, kind of um, political. Uh, you know the dissertations are very strong at, at Westminster, and, mm. and you know they do they produce a lot of. There's a prominent studio in our uni which produces a lot of um, a lot of politically charged projects mm. that that ask really big questions in the political scene. But I think uh, our, our unit, the unit I was in, mm. we 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 were asking very big political questions, sure. and we were just using narrative as a driver to sure. to bring that. But it might not be as prevalent in the visuals or the drawings. But it's very prevalent through the portfolio development and what we're asking, and maybe in our thesis hand-ins and mm. the whole. So, do you think it's unfair to kind of tie down one or two things that kind of generalize about universities and be like, "This is what they do, and this is what they do, and this is what they do"? I think so. You think so? Yeah, to a degree, yes. But I, d I definitely don't think um, the Butler looks down or whatever it is on any other uni because there's tutors that have been from the Butler that that teach in other places in yeah, Greenwich. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, Oxford, where, wherever it is yeah. and um, yeah it's just and maybe it depends on who's who's running the unit at the time or what happens or what the main ethos is mm -hmm. or what what specific unit tutors want to sort of progress or want to develop within their units and especially in the Bartlett there's there's 20 odd 20 plus units yeah from undergrad through to postgrad unit 10 11 12 13 all the way up to 20 something and 25 6 I, I, there's a lot of units and yeah, they all yeah. do something different be it be it typecasted into the drawing unit or the film unit or the whatever unit I think maybe in that sense yes there's a way of working mm. but having that brief and program everyone has a completely different outlook on what it might be even the most recent um Presence Medal project was a was from the film unit, but the project was called How to Carve a Giant, and it was about. Do you know what I mean this? Exactly. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's good to kind of clarify this that it it, it does seem to be unfair to kind of <laughs> to kind of just tie one aspect of a one university and generalize it, uh, about the whole thing. Um, and it, it it may just be that you're seeing a very predominant, very successful <laughs> aspect of the uni being kind of portrayed out, mm. and. Yeah, I feel like it, I feel like it could be unfair. But but the thing is, a, a lot of universities like to have the USP, if you like. Yeah, you know. So yeah, no, most definitely. Yeah, and um, I think that's that's fair to say to very established units that that have been running in certain unis. Yeah, that there is a particular way of working. You know, the output of blah 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 would be this drawing. The output of blah blah would be this final model. The output of this unit would be an amazing film. And I think that's what. Yeah, really is the USP of each different unit because mm -hmm. people apply to that unit aspiring to do that but when they enter it they go when can I do this drawing when can I do when can I make this film or whatever and you're like no 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 that's not how it works you need to develop a project and then and then that's what they open their eyes to and they go oh I didn't realise this process is like this I have to a lot of my sheets are just these research pages and and you, you build a really informed argument mm -hmm. and then once you have that arsenal behind you you go okay, I can do this amazing drawing now because all this research I can put in, all this development I can put in from everything down to flora, fauna, to understanding the seasons, what's been grown, what animals are local to your area, mm -hmm. to... Even how you draw the people. How you draw the people, That's exactly. actually one question I wanted to ask because it, it's really interesting seeing, because you, you said a lot of your figures were inspired by British kind of uh, novels and art. Mm. So I, I love looking at some of these figures. How much effort goes into drawing individual characters, or or are they are they kind of do you do you make a few and then just apply them to a lot of the drawings? I think effort is is a big word, and we definitely put a, a lot of effort into everything that we draw. Because uh, sorry, I don't really understand the question. Do you put I, a lot of effort into it? I think yes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, as in like you, sometimes you would see a scene which has been inhabited with almost a thousand people yeah but you zoom in mm. and you see oh my god so many of these faces are different yeah and i think the general way of actually uh, inhabiting a scene mm. uh, whether it's in practice or whether it's in you know in i guess the general design process um because obviously we're talking about your specific studio now mm. that's quite clear now we're not mm. talking about the bar as a whole um the general way would be to find a PNG or to to find mm. you know photograph of the, the a yeah. person or an action you think is most appropriate. Yeah. 
but to go to the efforts of like drawing these characters it, it takes I, me back to like my childhood yeah. i loved doing that that was my you know main way of drawing i think that's what really brings a drawing to life having all these differences and peculiarities and subtleties in the drawing really make it that much more special it if even if it's from people draw grass straight but i want to draw it slightly wavy because i want to say that the wind is coming from a certain direction and blowing this way and that's why everything slants a little bit or maybe a petal falls off because it's about i don't know whatever right about seasons changing or if it's oh there's a spider why oh because it's a very dark crevice that hasn't really been touched or oh there's a goat but it's very specific to uh, the isle of man that they have this type of goat or whatever it is or the leaves are a different color or why is there so many leaves in this certain area and so little in a different area is it because someone has then piled them in together or is it because it's all dropped from a certain tree that you can't see in the view and it's all it's all about denoting these sort of things that might not be in a drawing but people start to question these things and then everything that happens start to become really precise why is this person angry why is this person dancing are they dancing because the drawing is about festivity are they sleeping because it's about resting are they uh, arguing or talking because it's a debating chamber or whatever it might be or are they sitting in this space because that particular piece of architecture is important about sitting and enjoying this light or the ser serenity of the space and I think all these very small peculiarities and subtleties really make that drawing special because then you can just look at so many things and start to read into so many things and then it doesn't become that vacuous because you're not just drawing it for the sake of drawing it like there's also a drawing I had a lot of pies falling down and a lot of uh, smoke and people are, oh it's literally pies in the sky Eric <laughs> <laughs> but um what I wanted to show in that particular drawing was the tectonic, but I could only show the underside of it. And the underside of that tectonic was all about collecting all the fruits. But the top of it was the kitchen. And I couldn't show that kitchen because I wanted a ground level where you could see, like you said, all those bushes of the queen and the topiary and people activating that sort of garden. So to sort of denote the idea of the kitchen, um, I showed steam, I showed pies coming, falling down from it to go, actually, this is an urban kitchen. This, this is what the tectonic does. And this is, this is the time that's like, this is the season. These are the fruits being collected. These, and people are carrying pies. People are sitting down enjoying it. And it's about, it's just about, and maybe I'm going into too much detail, but it's no. all about bringing all these little things in that make that drawing so much more powerful. That's amazing. Hmm. I think that's amazing. I think that's the insight I really wanted from this from this discussion. Okay. <laughs> um, because it's, I think the most important thing about this uh, this podcast is to is to get everyone's view, to get, mm. if you like, two worlds, to get everyone's yeah. world perspective of it, um, and just think, you know, just following, you know, I was in a visual journey, just kind of following what you were saying <laughs> of how much, uh, yeah, the word you don't like effort. <laughs> because <laughs> everything needs effort to be good <laughs> but how much care and, and consideration goes into into all the nuances of the drawing mm. and that really will take your project and really t will take your drawing to to a place where you know you'll get featured on Vice <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think for those people who may be going through a bit of a drawer's block mm. you know I think a lot of people during the architectural course it's easy to lose motivation okay uh, I definitely see that maybe not for you <laughs> um, but I definitely see people you know they, they start to you know they need the extra kick of motivation again I think if you were to take your drawings to the next level and give that kind of care and uh, and, and consideration to your drawings you might find a whole you discover a whole new way of 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 of, of the value and the meaning of, of showing your visualization of getting your your message across definitely a drawing process is also part of the development process so as you're drawing through it you start to go what else where's the dark space where's the light space what activity happens um, is there a larger engagement in this certain space than th this space or where how does my t tectonic sit or my architecture sit does it look too big does it look too small can people walk through it can people inhabit it and then for some students the final drawings also becomes well for most it's still a development process it is all the way through mm -hmm. and yeah that's that's also 
a great tool and a great way of pushing your project forward. And how important is the sort of so do you do you go back and forth with the sketch and the modeling because developing those 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 extremely large detailed drawings mm. is that um what what's the sort of process with with developing that? Yeah, so once you have your ideas and your research and development of your project you, you go okay how do I bring it together and what am I trying to say in each drawing? Um I want this drawing to be about food security and about activity or whatever which piece of my master plan which part of my architecture really expresses that then you start to compose it and then you do a sketch you export a few views you bring them together and think okay how do these come together and what is the level of information I'm trying to say is it a perspective view of how people are meant to experience that space with a plan to show where it sits or whatever else it might be and then this process goes back and forth for your tutor and you might do <laughs> several setting up for a drawing no it's wrong it doesn't say the right story what are you trying to say it's not too small How, like and then it's a whole design process and you could finish a drawing print it out on this amazing massive sheet mm. and then that red marker goes on top <laughs> and circles this one thing you're like okay I'll do it again <laughs> but that's that's the level of rigor that goes into it yeah. you can think you've done a final drawing but and then it will change, change this, add this, develop this, consider this. And then that's how the drawing really becomes richer and richer and richer. You might spend a lot more longer time sort of composing a view and developing a view. Because once the view is right, you can just go out and do it. Mm. Because it says the right thing, it feels right, it's, it looks right. and Or it sells the project in a certain way. Which, pro which drawing took the longest? Um, there's a drawing called In Context. And uh, it was the one where there's an image of the Isle of Man in the foreground and all the architectures in the background. In the window, behind the window? No, it's uh, it's got a blue sky. Right. And it's got all the tectonics really large in the background. We'll find it. Yeah. That was, um, that, that drawing took me the longest because I was composing it for a very long time and I was modeling um, all the, well, I was helping, like, getting the model of sort of what the houses really look like in Isle of Man but then also how my architecture sits in the backdrop because a lot of the proposal is you know this my architecture but you need to sit it in something that people are familiar with just kind of see that distinction between what you're proposing and what it looks like in the Isle of Man and that drawing took a really long time and I'm not sure my tutor was <laughs> he was like it's not quite right it's not quite right and and that that did take a very long time and it wasn't wasn't How long? long composing it took a few days yeah like maybe two three days okay but um in general actually drawing each drawing maybe took a day and a half okay so once you compose it it could take half a day to compose a drawing some drawings took half a day some took a day but composing it also means exporting the lines getting it mm -hmm. out getting out of the computer getting the shadows out preparing it and then sitting it out and then getting it changed and changed and changed and changed again and, and then applying all that color to it is that how long does that take and, and do, what do you use photoshop for that oh yeah purely photoshop just photoshop yep. going in with the wand yep and filling it in and yeah that's that's literally does that take long the color? there's no trick to that it's <laughs> literally just filling it in some people might use a model and color associate in the model mm -hmm. that based on layers and then it's much easier to magic one from there or, or whatever it yeah. might be um but yeah it's really about just taking the time filling each thing and showing that subtle differences yeah you always wish you had more time for drawing yeah. but then there's a moment where you know you, you're being guided and said move on you know yeah. this is this is it you don't need to spend more time in it let's, let's do the next drawing let's do the next drawing let's do the next drawing and that's why we get these eight nine ten drawings done within these two three weeks because you're just constantly on it and you're just doing it as you're composing a new drawing you might be doing another one mm. and it's this really tight time frame and you're like, wow, <laughs> I need to keep going, keep going. I actually um, remember a time when the, the deadline was um, something like 9, nine or 10 a.m. the next morning. And I finished the night before around 7. And, <laughs> and I was like, great, finished the drawing. <laughs> um, went to my tutor and went, look, I've, yeah. I've done it. He goes, great, so between 7 and 9, it's more time, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I went. Okay. 
<laughs> so god. in that time frame, he goes, "You got enough. You got time to do another drawing." Oh my god! And that was my fastest drawing. And that drawing was um, is it's like a section cut window drawing, in of an interior view. Yeah. And yeah, it's quite like a purple that drawing with that that view. So you did that in two hours. I did that between like early like seven and I don't know, one or two, and that that, that was the fastest drawing because you just. I was like, oh, okay, shit, I need, I need to get this view out. I need to do this. Checked with him. It's like, okay, yeah, go do it. I was like, okay, I'm <laughs> going to go do it. So that was that night. And then, sounds crazy, but it was also the first all night I've ever done all year. Really? 100%, yeah. So you must be really good with time management? Um, I think once serious? you're... We, we're called Unit 10, and sometimes there's a joke where it's Unit 10 to 10, mm. where you, I get up at... T- I, I get into uni for 10, and I work till 10, and I stay consistent. I think... Staying consistent and hard working is important because some might disagree about the late nights, but mm. I think doing these late nights are quite detrimental to the next day because you spend more time resting up and preparing again and, and getting over and going through the motions of architecture again. They're detrimental? Yeah, I mean, it hurts your health a bit okay, yeah. and you might have to sleep a bit more or yeah, yeah. rest up a bit more the next day, but as long as you stay consistent, you're going to constantly do 12 hours each day. Mm. If you do 24 hours one day and then... And then sleep for <laughs> another twenty four hours. Okay, so you're saying being just being consistently, you know, hard working is better than being, you know, yeah. here and there and then doing like massive all nighters. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, definitely. And agree. that all nighter wasn't really an all nighter. It was um I did finish the drawing about one or two. And I was asking around the Bartlett, I was like, What's the what time does the Bartlett open? They're like, oh, eight eight something. I went What's the earliest time someone queues up for a plotter? <laughs> yeah, we've all asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> because the drawings we do are fairly large. Yeah. They're very large prints. They're called um, quad elephant the size. It's an actual... Is term. it bigger than A0? It's one, 1018 by 1372. Oh, Lord. Okay. And that's the size of the drawing. And we're like, we can only do it on those plotters. Wow. And... Then you've got certain different years, maybe undergrads printing the whole portfolio last minute in A3, and you're like, please, I need to use the plotter. <laughs> so they're like, ah. Oh. You just put one in your studio. No, we have now. Yeah. But it, it, it wasn't around during my time. <laughs> <laughs> but then, um, so they're like, oh, people queue up around five. And I was like, oh, people queue up at five. That means some people will come at three. <laughs> And I come at four, sorry. So I was like, maybe I should come at three. <laughs> so you? I finished the drawing and I was drawing outside the parlor and I sat there. You drawing outside the parlor? I was finishing off the drawing. In yeah. what? On what? Just on my laptop. Oh, wow. And, um, and then I wasn't even the first one there. <laughs> <laughs> and then I queued and then finished that drawing and that was the only all night I ever did. And I handed in and, uh, and that was that day. To be, uh, I mean, <sighs> it, this, isn't, this isn't just... You know, this isn't just limited to the bot. This is architecture culture. It's, it's, it's bad, isn't it? Yeah, this is how <laughs> school, architecture school works. And it's it's in, I guess it's a question a lot of people have is, is what is the best way to work? And is it possible to, 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 to be so good at doing your work and your time yeah. management that yeah. you're not having to do these crazy things? And I think, 100%. as you just said, you know, that was your only all-nighter. I think the greatest thing I've ever learned um, is making quick decisions and running with it and really just going okay because if you just think too long you just you end up going do i draw this until it's right do i only draw it when it's right and then you'll never develop your project that way Mm -hmm. as long as you put pen to paper and you do something be it right or wrong at least you've kind of followed your initial intuition your initial idea and then from that you can kind of work into it and develop it and push it further and that way you're not bringing a new idea every time you're kind of developing on what you've initially drawn and that way, you've you've got a discussion with your tutor, you've got a discussion with your peers, you've got a visual discussion with yourself. Mm. If you keep thinking it through in your head and never really committing to it, then you're just not you're not really progress. yeah you're not making progress. You're not developing it. You don't have the research to inform it. You've got nothing on pen to paper. But it depends on certain units and how they work. Mm. But I think that's that's the most powerful thing I took away, especially mm. teaching recently. I, I realize that more that the moment they put pen to paper be it right or wrong I can have a conversation with them yeah and I can go oh, actually why don't you consider it this way yeah. unless you draw it I I can't see it yeah <laughs> I think that's a very repeated statement for yeah. the tutors to say yeah <laughs> and that's very mm-hmm. powerful having making quick decisions really running with it really developing an idea mm. and not being scared of it being right or wrong mm. 
or having it to be perfect before you show it to someone. Mm -hmm. That's why you don't do these final drawings until the end because if you're so precious about this throughout the way, you're never going to really develop it. But once you have all this stuff, you're like, okay, I can do the drawing now with confidence. Mm, definitely, man. That's, that's, I think it's really good to get your, uh, you know, your insight. Um, I'm kind of just closing off. Okay. I would say, I think there's a loads of very, very valuable advice in 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 this discussion that people can take away, which is what I was hoping for. Oh, great. The whole <laughs> the ideal architecture student. Um, <laughs> Have fun, actually. That's also a very important thing, because like you said, students lose motivation or whatever, but you really need to believe in your project. Mm. And so that was my question. What, what, more, what more advice would you have for, for people entering into the subject? For mm. I'm sure you, you're all your students right now. You yeah. know, what, do you, what do you tell them? Um, tell them to look at a lot of references, definitely be inspired, and definitely enjoy what you do. It sounds really cliche, mm. but once you believe your project, enjoy what you do, you put in the, the utmost care and time and everything into it, it's kind of self-indulgent at times but once you do really get into it it's it's amazing and actually one student said a very powerful and inspiring thing to me um, on Thursday this tutorial we had a tutorial and I went okay it's coming along we're developing the architecture it's uh, the plan and sections coming along but I'd it'd be great to see you do this amazing drawing that really encapsulates your project and then I said wouldn't it be great I to do this drawing when people see it, it'd be like, wow, a third year did it, and you're a first year. Wouldn't be that amazing? <laughs> and then she looked at me and went, how do I get there? And that really touched me, and I thought that was powerful, and that sh to me showed her, showed me how she was really hungry to learn, and she was really willing to try hard, and she she was just like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try really hard, I'm gonna put care and love into this project, and I can't wait to see this final drawing outcome. Wow. And that was, yeah, that was very powerful for me. So I'm looking forward to see, hopefully, how we can really get her there. Amazing, man. I think just to finally cap that off, I would say what this podcast kind of makes me realise is people think of the Bartlett as, people think of the Bartlett as like the untouchables, you know, the, mm. the, the ideal kind of school and people and, you know, we'll never be able to be like, you know, that good and... Mm. I, I'm being honest, mm. you know, I'm not trying to, you know, sugarcoat anything. I've heard people say these things. Mm, okay. Um, it's, it's very, imp and it, with my personal journey as well uh, mm -hmm. in architecture school, you know, I went from flopping. I really was flopping in my mm -hmm. first year. I had, I had no motivation to do, you know, to, to, to really excel in this. And I ended up getting amazing marks. Mm. Uh, I ended up graduating with a, with a really great degree and, it was something which I feel like one or two tutors wouldn't have thought possible mm -hmm. coming from so low to, to reaching where I did. And I personally didn't didn't think I could do that. Mm. But one thing that was very strong and what did make me, I guess, reach the right place I needed to be was just intense hunger, like you yeah. say, intense drive. And I think for anyone who thinks, because this, 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 uh, this field of studies is incredibly challenging and competitive mm. uh, and some people are trying and some people aren't getting the right results that they want mm. and I feel like it's as long as you are willing to to be proactive in that area and ask the questions from the people don't be afraid of mm. of reaching out to people asking what they did to, to get what they did mm. you know 100% yeah y you might brush off someone as like oh he's just really great but you don't realize that behind the facade if you like mm. he's an incredibly hard working person there's mm. a reason these results are being achieved mm. so go and find them and put them into action most definitely it's um beyond just schools or whatever it is it's most definitely the individual and how much work you put into it how much care you put into it and how much you love it and really want it and that's very important as well Brilliant, man. I really appreciate the, the conversation. I will just finally finish off with a question someone had, had asked earlier. Sure. So he's a friend from uh, a friend of us from uh, Shepherd Studio in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. uh, and he asked, what's the dropout rate at the Bartlett, um, specifically <laughs> due to people taking on part-time jobs? Is it quite a lot? Because the work um, load would probably be quite challenging. I'm not so sure the dropout rate is that high in the master's level. Right. But I know that it's quite high in first years. Really? Um, yeah, because 
student center they've never done architecture before they don't expect the culture of the way of working in architecture yeah. let alone the Bartlett or any other school it's probably challenging for most first year students because yeah. it's I'm teaching first years now you they you know students now are paying a lot more in terms of fees they're trying to consider the decision they've got you know personal issues or academic like endeavors that they're not sure they can get to or mm-hmm. like you said they have part-time jobs as well and I think you have to find that priority when you're in first year whether to take a job on and do architecture or to really give up the job and they're like oh if I give up the job I won't have money and it's it's uh, a <laughs> I assume you had no job, or did you were you working while you did your masters? Uh, I was fortunate enough to live at home in right. London, so so you didn't need to work. Uh, it was okay. Awesome. Yeah, but um, but I can see the challenges that students are facing. Definitely. And it's hard, but I, I'm not quite sure the exact dropout rate because I don't want to state a wrong statistic. Sure, but sure. I mean, generally, you don't you you've seen people in masters who are balancing a job and being and they're still able to keep up with the with the studio. I've seen some people start to quit their jobs. Right. and realise that actually I need to commit for the last few months Right, it's like a few months left of architecture school or retaking the year it's like yeah. the the you know yeah it seems to be quite similar in most unis I believe yeah of course yeah. so it's not, not, not different at the bottom <laughs> no no different no cool. okay <laughs> awesome man really appreciate it man no. thank you for having this discussion with me no thank you for having me I hope it wasn't too uh, grilling with the no, um, <laughs> I actually enjoy these questions because yeah. then it's an opportunity to kind of shed light on how yeah. some aspects of different schools might work or different units Definitely. or studios might work and the process behind it just so that it isn't just this final outcome. But and and finally, a little bit about you right now. Like, So you're, you're, you're teaching, is that what you're doing full time? Um, so I work four days a week in an architectural practice. I work in AHMM. Hey, Jim, and uh, I teach in Greenwich one day a week to first year architecture students and um, it's been an exciting journey Amazing. in the past two years since graduating two and a half cool and what would you think you know what's in the future do you think you would start your own firm I'm not quite sure I'm ready yeah I'd like to gain a bit more Eventually, experience do you think you would though um, there's an ambition or hope maybe in the future maybe not so near future but definitely I'd like to gain the right experience, be it on site or seeing a project to an end or just, yeah, yeah in general before I feel confident to do that because I do enjoy the academic side of things, coming up with ideas mm. and I want to be able to be also have a sort of level of building clarity, social responsibility and sort of everything else that that comes with being an architect to really bring it together before I make my own venture. Very wise. <laughs> Amazing, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks, man. Thanks. Cheers, bro. Cheers. <laughs> I hope that wasn't too... Uh... <laughs> Is that all right? Yeah, that was great. Thank that. you. Yeah.